Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming to our November webinar for the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. My name is Hugh Daigle. I'm an associate professor here in the center, and I'm going to give a little introduction before we have our speakers. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment consists of 25 researchers whose research spans a diverse number of fields related to uh, research on subsurface energy. Uh, the research that we have here uh, covers a lot of different categories, um, everywhere from conventional oil and gas to carbon storage and geothermal, some work on hydrates. We have a number of technical disciplines represented by the 25 researchers here, ranging from production engineering to computational sciences, petrophysics, rock mechanics, and a number of different tools that we use in our investigations. We have uh, several industrial affiliates programs as well, affiliated with the center, um, which you can see here. The newest here is the Carbon Utilization Storage and Transportation, IAP, which we had a webinar about back in July. You can visit our website for more information on all of these IAPs. We have monthly webinars, usually around the first Friday of the month. Uh, these are intended to be industry driven webinars that will be of interest to people outside the university as a way of disseminating our relevant information. They're usually on the first Friday at noon central time and they're given via Microsoft Teams as we are here. And then we upload the webinars to our YouTube channel uh, within a few days of the webinar. So you can go check that out if there's something you missed or you can distribute the link to your colleagues. We have a couple of upcoming webinars. Next month on December 3rd, one of our newer faculty members, um, Arvind Ravi Kumar, is going to give a webinar about the energy transition and sustainability. This is going to be a very interesting talk. I'm excited about it. And then our January webinar will be on January 7th. And another one of our new faculty members, Silvio Levescu, will give a presentation on a topic to be determined. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today who are going to tell us about geological storage of hydrogen. Uh, we have Dr. Peter Eichhubel, who is a research professor here. He uh, is affiliated with the Bureau of Economic Geology and works on fluid flow in various systems, including geothermal, fracture networks, and reservoir geomechanics. Our other speaker is Dr. Mushta Del Shad, who is affiliated with the center here in the uh, Department of Pet the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. She is a research professor and focuses on modeling and simulation for enhanced oil recovery, CO2 storage, and hydrogen storage, which we will hear about today. So, with that, I would like to give it over to uh, Dr. Eichhubel, who is going to be our first speaker for the afternoon. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Uh, the talk is um, a co-presentation. It will be split in two parts. The first part will give you an introduction to hydrogen and in particular hydrogen storage, geological storage and uh, an overview of a new program that um, we have launched jointly between the BG and the um, Petroleum Engineering um, Department on um, the geologic aspects of hydrogen storage. And then in the second part, Professor Delshad will uh, present some uh, first results on uh, simulations of hydrogen storage in the subsurface. So the first part is aspirational, more forward looking, and then um, uh, maybe uh, the second part is then more inspirational than the first part. Um, I'm presenting here um, a, a team of researchers at the BEG and the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment uh, that um, is very diverse. We cover all aspects of resource characterization, the geology, geophysics, petrophysics, geomechanics, um, and then the reservoir engineering side, and also the energy economics. Um, because as you will see in this presentation, um, the um, directions hydrogen is headed are in many ways very uncertain. Uh, the economics are uncertain. So in focusing and directing our research, we need to have some idea what is a viable technology and which one is not. So the economy side is really important in this. We get some assistance from the Center for Electromechanics, uh, Bob Hebner's group, um, 
who are dealing more on the surface side of um, hydrogen um, storage and uh, transmission. Now, hydrogen is a lot in the news and um, being discussed as a um, partial solution to the transition to a low carbon economy. And uh, the reasons are, there's many arguments to be made for hydrogen. One is the low carbon emissions. Um, um, it can be generated by electrolysis, uh, for instance, from solar or wind sources, nuclear or geothermal, without carbon emissions. It can be generated and is currently being generated from natural gas. Which, if sequestered, if the uh, which emits CO2, but if sequestered, it could be conceivably uh, CO2 emissions free, and it can be used um, for power generation either through fuel cells or in turbines or even in a combustion engine without emitting CO2. Hydrogen can be transported uh, in pipelines, just like natural gas. It can be liquefied and then uh, transported in a ship on a truck. Um, it can be uh, used for uh, and, and transported as ammonia, for instance, or as natural gas hydrogen mix, um, so in various compounds. It can be stored. This will be the main focus of this presentation. Um, multiple sources, uh, el electrolysis is one. Um, currently, the majority of hydrogen for industrial purposes is uh, obtained through natural gas reforming and then traditional through coal gasification and multiple uses. Um, so the diagram on the right side uh, comes from DOE. It's a little bit complicated, complex, but on the left side, um, let me turn on the pointer here. On the left side, it shows uh, various sources through renewables, nuclear, fossil uh, fuels with CCUS or without, and they are often referred to in colors, green uh, for hydrogen from renewables, blue for uh, hydrogen from fossil sources with carbon uh, capture, but um, I'm, I won't use those color designations much in my talk. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the right side are various applications, um, industrial uses, ammonia, metals production, um, refining, uh, chemical industry, and then transportation, um, either um, in vehicles through fuel cells or um, yeah, or um, through synthetic fuels and then power generation. So it can be um, used in turbines um, and then um, in conjunction with energy storage, uh, with hydrogen storage, it could be used to um, meet energy demand during peak hours, peak demand hours, or even for the uh, base load. So um, that's um, kind of sums up what the advantages of hydrogen are. The projected use, um, there are several studies out there, and um, as you can imagine, with this being a new, it's actually not a new technology, it's been around for a while, being discussed many times, but now I think we're getting to the point that hydrogen has a good chance of taking off. Um, but the projections vary widely, and um, you see on the right side of one assessment by the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association, which is a trade group of hydrogen producers, so they are perhaps shining a very positive light on this, but um, you can see uh, for 2030 and for 2050, a base assumption and an ambitious assumption and um, divided by sector. Um, there's obviously a lot of assumptions that go into this, um, especially for instance, transportation. Uh, it may be perhaps more viable for larger trucks, for small cars. Uh, the network of, of fuel stations could be uh, deterrent. So this is all to be seen, quite honestly. Um, another study here on the bottom left by NREL, um, it comes up with similar scenarios um, using different assumptions. So the bottom line here, this is very unscripted. And in moving forward, we have to keep um, that in mind um, as we develop uh, ideas about storage. Now, why do we need to worry about storage? Um, there is, um, this purpose of storage is obviously to even out variations in supply and demand. And um, that variation can be on a daily basis as seen in the top right diagram. And what that shows is 
the daily net load for um, a scenario in California in this case for going from the past to the future with an increasing um, production of uh, wind and solar electricity. And peak demand is in the evening, but obviously solar is most uh, efficient during the day. So with increasing uh, deployment of wind and, and solar, you get this uh, over generation during the day and a lack of generation in the evening. So this has been referred to as the duck curve. So this is daily variation, but this is also applicable to uh, seasonal variation. So the lower diagram here is, it's a hypothetical scenario, assuming that all the power comes from 100% renewables. Um, again, for California, so in the winter, you have a deficit. In the summer, you have a surplus in generation with some spikes um, if there's a bad weather event, for instance, right? Um, now you could argue you just build enough solar and wind power plants to meet peak demand, but that would be highly inefficient because then most of the time of the year, those extra um, um, plants would be sitting idle. So instead of building um, the plants to meet peak demand, you want to store excess production, um, in this case during the summer, for use in the winter, right? So that's um, seasonal storage. And it turns out that hydrogen can be a very useful um, storage medium for energy. So this plot here shows storage duration. It goes actually from seconds to season, and then the discharge power. And the, the shortest, this is just grid stability, right? Um, so they use capacitors for this and flywheels. Um, for hours to days, batteries can uh, meet the storage need. Um, ERCOT is building a 200 megawatt uh, battery uh, storage site that could power 40,000 homes for a couple of hours. So that's about 10th, 11th of the size of Austin. Longer than that, so there is also compressed air, uh, pumped hydro storage, obviously, been, uh, that can go for weeks. But uh, for really seasonal storage, hydrogen would be uh, an appealing energy carrier. So it can go from hours in surface tanks to seasonal storage in the subsurface and perhaps even beyond that. Um, if you think about strategic storage of energy, um, it may go beyond seasonal. It may be multi-year storage, right? So an overview over existing storage methods. The, um, the pressure vessels at the surface, um, either in spherical vessels or in concrete containers, pipe storage, that is obviously small amounts um, for short duration. Then cryogenic, it has the advantage of higher energy density. It's used, for instance, by NASA, used to be used for by NASA for rockets, but um, you have the cooling is obviously energy intensive, so it's not cheap to do. Uh, there's also cryocompressed where you use both low temperature and um, pressure to liquefy hydrogen. And then um, geologic storage, where you compress, uh, where you inject compressed gas, hydrogen gas, either in salt caverns, in lined rock caverns, or in porous reservoirs, uh, saline aquifers, and depleted oil and gas fields. And the capacity of this, uh, so the numbers taken here are from a economic analysis. Those are just, you know, um, representative numbers. Um, you see the difference between stored and working capacity. Working capacity is always less than the stored capacity. Um, and um, force reservoirs in principle could be, you know, for all practical purposes, an infinite storage capacity. Now, um, to zoom into this topic a little bit further, um, the choice among those different storage technologies is controlled in part um, by the duration that's intended of storage, by the end use, what available infrastructure. And then if we're talking about geologic storage, obviously by the subsurface geology as well. So um, solution ca caverns and salt domes, well, you need to have salt layers in the subsurface 
which is shown here by green for the US. Not every part of the country has that, right? The Texas Gulf Coast has is in a very good position for this, uh, having abundant salt domes. Um, depleted oil and gas fields in red, well, sedimentary basins, but not all of them have oil and gas resources. So, um, but you see this, it's much more widely available. And then saline aquifers, every sedimentary basin more or less qualifies. There's obviously parts of the US that don't have that either, right? So the choice of the storage medium is geology dependent. And if you look at current present day natural gas storage in the lower right here, you see that um, salt domes for natural gas storage is used primarily in the south. Um, depleted oil and gas fields more or less all over the country. And then aquifers somewhere in the Midwest here. So that's actually already telling you how the, the preferred choice of subsurface storage for hydrogen will vary regionally and geographically. And they are complementary approaches. It's not just one trumps the other, although uh, salt domes, salt caverns are the most economic one at this time. So overall, some pros and cons of geological storage. In principle, unlimited capacity, um, cost effective for long term storage compared to surface uh, infrastructure, which you have to maintain. Um, there's no pun punishment if you just keep it stored in the subsurface. Um, Cons, uh, we will hear this in the second part of the talk, uh, losses by diffusion dispersion. Um, there's some chemical interactions that contaminate your hydrogen. Um, you may not be able to retrieve, you will not be able to retrieve all the hydrogen back that you inject into the subsurface. Um, and then the limitations by the subsurface geology. So let's talk a little bit about salt cavern storage. There are three sites in operation in Texas, uh, the yellow stars here. Um, in each case, there are um, large solution cavities um, and they are really, really large structures here. Um, there's a commonly uh, reported comparison of putting the Empire State Building in one of those. Um, the largest one currently has 8,000 tons of hydrogen uh, as the um, uh, storage volume. A site is proposed for Mississippi that would store 10 times as this, and I presume it's not a single uh, cavern, it would be multiple caverns. Uh, it's proven technology. Um, one issue obviously is you have to dispose of the brine when you solution mine those cavities, and you may have some contamination issues with uh, chemical interaction with some impurities in the soil. Um, porous media storage is more the frontier. Um, it is um, not currently practiced for pure hydrogen, but there is historic experience um, storing natural gas hydrogen blends in the subsurface. It has obviously the potential of widest geographic distribution. You could stack it with carbon sequestration, uh, sequestration in deeper layers, uh, hydrogen storage in the shallow layers. Um, you have to dispose of the brine that you're displacing by injecting the hydrogen. Um, there are some chemical effects that are not that well understood that needs more research. If it is a depleted oil and gas field, we need to be aware of uh, integrity of abandoned wells. If it is a saline aquifer, we have to worry about the cap rock um, being tied, um, something we don't have to worry about with an abandoned oil field. Now, why is this a good time for us to work in this area? Well, if we compare hydrogen storage in the future with the current natural gas storage, the uh, US stores 4 trillion cubic feet of natural gas um, in the subsurface, and it's um, mostly porous reservoirs and um, uh, salt caverns. Currently, um, the US and the soil in Texas stores 6 billion cubic feet of hydrogen. So if we want to replace hydrogen, uh, natural gas with hydrogen, we have to scale this up um, by a factor of 1,000. Um, and you may argue, well, we could convert existing natural gas storage to hydrogen storage, but we have to keep in mind that the energy density of hydrogen is about a third of that of natural gas. And then in the second part, you will hear that um, uh, a natural gas uh, storage site can 
in one case at least, can only take a third of the volume in hydrogen. So there's another factor of 10 that we need to increase storage capacity. And then another factor is that it's probably easier to ramp up natural gas production if there are um, in pink demand times, which you may not be able to do with hydrogen. So we may even need more capacity than, than we currently have for natural gas. So it's a huge challenge if you want to go that route. So um, a few slides of what our consortium plans on doing. One is resource assessment. Where is the storage space and how much is there? I cannot show you a results at this point, but I can show you what we have done for CO2 storage, for instance, here the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, it's just estimating the amount of pore space, space available for storage, but then obviously you have to zoom in on structures that are suitable to store and confine the hydrogen. It's different from CO2 where you try to dispose of it. In the case of hydrogen, you want to be able to produce as much as you can of what you have injected. It's a valuable commodity, right? Um, using geophysics to characterize the reservoirs and their structures, um, and then perhaps also using geophysics to monitor um, the um, migration of the hydrogen in the subsurface. So what I'm showing in the bottom right here is a synthetic seismic model where um, Chit Patacharya has replaced um, um, the brine with um, a fluid of the density of, of hydrogen to simulate how that would show up in seismic. Uh, we need to look at risk analysis, leakage potential, either by diffusion, there's a diffusion plot here, somewhat hypothetical on the left side. We may have to consider um, capillary breakthrough, we may have to consider fracturing to the cap rock or fault reactivation. This is work we did for saltwater disposal, but the similar type of work may have to be done for hydrogen and keeping in mind hydrogen has a lower density of than natural gas, so it would provide more stress on the cap rock than um, we would experience in a um, gas storage facility. And then um, again, the economy. So there are uh, the economic aspects. There are two sides to it. One is the value chain analysis is saying what is the supply? What is the potential future demand? and then come with scenarios that will um, allow us to say, well, we should focus perhaps our research on locations where the um, hydrogen is being produced, whereas in other cases, it may be more economic to focus on areas to store hydrogen where it is being consumed. So that we need some guidance from the economy side to uh, direct our storage research. And then also, this is site specific evaluate which subsurface storage option is more economic. Um, is it salt cabins versus depleted oil and gas fields? And our team has done this for West Texas um, to investigate. There are some salt layers there, so salt cabins are an option. Will it be more economic to use salt cabins versus depleted oil and gas fields, aquifers or line cabins? And without going into details, I'm not an economist, but it turns out that the, in this particular case, the salt caverns are more cost beneficial. And for some reason, if you factor in that this is for uh, up to 2030, um, if you factor in also the taxes, then line caverns actually would, um, would have a negative net present value. So that's clearly not an option in this case. Um, so again, um, this is tricky because you have to anticipate, anticipate future demand. And economists are very smart about this. They focus in part on the certain use of hydrogen, which is current present day use, and then make some projections about future uses such as transportation and come up with multiple scenarios that um, try to factor this in. Uh, with this, I am handing over to uh, my co-presenter. So uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, introduction. Uh, so my name is Mojda Dalshad. I'm a research professor here in the Department of Petroleum Engineering. Uh, my uh, co-authors on this work, uh, Dr. Uh, Kami Sapanuri, uh, and of course, Peter uh, Yalnur Omar Zakov, uh, Dr. Reza Ganja Ganesh, and Dr. M Mehran Mehrabi. I have to acknowledge the financial support from um, Hildebrand. Uh, we got it in 
December of 2020. Uh, and this has been a nine month uh, project. So we really appreciate this uh, initial funding from Hildebrand. Uh, so is the timing is perfect because uh, I just got the uh, new journal of JPT. Uh, so October 2021 and the first uh, the cover page was about hydrogen. Uh, and one of the projects that they're going to look at uh, offshore uh, green hydrogen uh, production and of course has nothing to do with the storage at this point. Uh, but it's still exciting that they're going to look at uh, offshore uh, generation of uh, green hydrogen and eventually storage will become part of it. So if you're not familiar with some of the activities, I just listed uh, some of the projects that, um, you know, different part of the world they're talking about their commitment uh, to hydrogen uh, production and also different types of uh, storage. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Peter mentioned about the high store and this will be the first US zero carbon green hydrogen storage in Mississippi. They announced it in October and this will be 10 times larger than any other green hydrogen proje uh, project under consideration in the US. And uh, the commitment is to produce about 110 million kilogram of green hydrogen and store about 70 million of that in three salt caverns. And the expectation is it's going to be a, a commercial service by 2025. And of course, uh, there are other projects. Uh, the one that we saw on JPT uh, cover page and there's an article on it is the one that is going to be North Sea on Netherlands side. Uh, it's called a Post Haydn project. And Oman also in May announced a consortium uh, that they're going to generate a green hydrogen from solar and wind and produce a million tons of uh, green hydrogen. There is a project in Germany, H2 Store, uh, Austria, Sun Storage, uh, France, uh, that they're going to do small scale salt cavern demonstration project, uh, Ireland, they're going to look at uh, green hydrogen and storage in natural gas reservoir. Uh, Argentina, uh, they're looking at H2 storage in depleted oil and gas reservoirs. And then uh, there are a lot of other projects going on and activities looking at the blending of hydrogen with natural gas and also the impact of hydrogen on the facility and so on from the national labs and, you know, uh, especially in Australia, gas are looking at blending of different gases. So our research uh, has been really focusing on uh, looking at the feasibility and performance of hydrogen storage in several geological formations by doing uh, numerical simulations. And of course, it has to be multi-phase flow and compositional. And then ultimately develop a screening tool for site selection. Uh, and this is something that is in progress and uh, hopefully we can uh, de uh, develop something very useful, uh, easy to use tool for site selection. So here I listed some of the questions that we need to respond to, to be comfortable in storing hydrogen in uh, porous media. The first thing is how does hydrogen behave in subsurface. What are the differences between hydrogen and natural gas and CO2 where we have a lot of experiences in uh, storing in subsurface? What are the relevant physics, chemistry, geochemistry, and biochemistry related to hydrogen? Uh, what are we looking for uh, an effective storage reservoir? Uh, in terms of the wells, what is the best and uh, most cost effective well design? And of course, reservoir characterization and structure will uh, have some impact on that as well. And looking at the long term performance, because you, when you use this storage sites, you go through multiple uh, cycles of injection and extraction. And can we reduce the loss of the gas due to the cushion gas? 
and are there alternatives to potentially use other gases like nitrogen or CO2 as cushion gas, not hydrogen. And also, Peter mentioned about the leakage. Can we use our reservoir engineering hat and good site selection to mitigate uh, some of the uh, leakage risks? And of course, uh, in such a short uh, uh, project that we had, we won't be able to respond to all of these questions, but hopefully over time as a group, we will. So uh, the industry has a lot of experience in storing different gases in subsurface. So this is not something that we'd be worrying about that we don't know how to do it. We know how to do it. Uh, the first uh, underground storage of natural gas actually was done in 1950 in a partially depleted gas field in Canada. And then hydrogen rich town gas was stored in aquifer in France in 1956. Helium 1960 has been stored uh, in a reservoir in Texas. And by 1977, we had almost about 500 uh, gas storage uh, projects uh, in aquifer, in depleted oil and gas and salt caverns. And the reference actually is coming from an old 1979 uh, publication. So some of the critical requirements uh, for uh, storage are, and this is something that we try to respond in this uh, research, uh, are we want to make sure that when you inject hydrogen stays in place and in a confined volume, so then you'll be able to produce it back with minimal losses. And uh, losses here, we're talking about maybe the cushion gas. You need to have minimal losses to leakage through wells, cap rock, and uh, underlying aquifer. Any diffusion that may happen, uh, loss to the solubility in the water or maybe uh, other uh, fluids. Be able to produce back at high rate to meet the demand in terms of the power and making sure your facility in terms of the number of wells, uh, injection, extraction, potentially pump wells, they're uh, cost effective. And a uh, lot of concern about purity of hydrogen, especially when you uh, inject it into natural gas uh, storage and making sure what are the end use for that hydrogen because there are uh, some uh, usage of hydrogen that requires very pure uh, hydrogen. You cannot use a blend. So the first thing uh, we, we looked at was uh, what are the analogs for hydrogen storage? Of course, uh, CO2 storage in saline aquifer, CCS, uh, storage and utilization in oil reservoirs, natural gas storage, and then looking at onshore versus offshore uh, storage sites. So our simulation workflow uh, started with uh, taking one uh, case that was a candidate for natural uh, gas storage and comparing that with hydrogen. So keeping all the conditions the same, just replacing the natural gas with hydrogen and comparing the two strategies. The other case, uh, we looked at actually two uh, CO2 in saline aquifer um, cases that we had access to the reservoir model and then compare it with hydrogen storage. Then uh, we start looking at optimization of these uh, projects for hydrogen storage, looking at the locations of the wells, orientation, perform, uh, perforation, and so on. Uh, we carefully looked at uh, the physical properties and also looked at sensitivity to relative permeability and capillary pressure based on uh, published data for hydrogen and water. And then eventually, uh, we also looked at the strategy of injection and extraction in terms of the cycles uh, and the presence of the pump wells and how to utilize them. And of course, for this early uh, work, 
our focus was mainly on be able to assess the uh, capacity of the hydrogen uh, store, get some ideas about the efficiency in terms of the uh, working capacity, and that's what you can sell to the market. Uh, so we did not include geochemistry or, uh, for example, hysteresis and relative permeability and capillary pressure, biochemistry and so on. So it was mainly focused on the uh, flow and transport. So we had three cases uh, that we already had a calibrated history match dynamic geological model for. Uh, one was the Cranfield site where CO2 EOR and CO2 storage uh, or injection pilot was done in saline aquifer. The second case was a natural gas storage in Colorado. And the third one is the Frio site is a saline, uh, again, saline uh, aquifer that uh, they did the CO2 injection uh, demonstration. We focused on making sure the existing equation of state and PVT models, they can capture the properties of hydrogen, uh, density, solubility, compressibility, and viscosity. And then comparing hydrogen with natural gas and CO2, and then running sensitivity cases and try to make an attempt to optimize uh, the hydrogen storage. Here I show uh, some of the data that we collected for hydrogen uh, properties. Uh, top one is the density as a function of pressure at the fixed temperature, uh, comparing the density of hydrogen against methane and CO2. And you see that hydrogen is almost 10 times less dense than methane. And for the viscosity as a function of pressure, fixed temperature, Again, hydrogen almost three times less viscous than methane. So the, met the hydrogen is going to be more buoyant and is going to have much higher mobility compared to either methane or CO2. These graphs, they show that we were pretty much uh, pleased uh, with the equation of state and the physical property models that we have in our simulators, and they can capture the uh, density and viscosity of the hydrogen without any issue. So this is density. Uh, blue is the calculated versus uh, dots, they're the measurements and this is the viscosity. So it seems like we really don't have to do anything with our uh, equation of state or physical property models that we've been using for gases for many years. Then uh, we collected data on uh, relative permeability and capillary pressure. So this is the case from Yecta in 2018 from France. Uh, he measured steady state relative permeability for water and uh, hydrogen uh, in addition to capillary pressure. I didn't put that here, but he also measured the uh, capillary pressure for hydrogen and water. So we included this uh, data set in uh, some of our sensitivity simulations that we uh, conducted. We also looked at the solubility of different gases in water and comparing hydrogen with them. And this is showing the solubility in water in grams per kilogram of water as a function of temperature at atmospheric pressure. Uh, hydrogen has the lowest solubility compared to methane and CO2, and it seems like even uh, temperature has very little impact on hydrogen solubility, at least within the range of uh, data here, uh, 20 or 10 to 60 degree uh, Cs. So I'm going to uh, discuss very briefly some of the cases that we ran and the results. Uh, this is Cranfield uh, in Mississippi, where a CO2 was injected in a small pilot in saline aquifer. And there are other uh, activities there that they were doing CO2 EOR. So this blue uh, box is where the CO2 EOR activities were going on with about a million uh, tons of CO2 per year was injected. And then this smaller uh, section here is where CO2 was injected into the deeper formation in saline uh, aquifer. 
there was one injector uh, and two uh, observation monitoring wells uh, for the CO2 injection project. So there was a geological model that was provided to us uh, and it was history matched against the uh, CO2 injection into the aquifer. Uh, so this is a snapshot of the model. This is the EOR activities and the wells and the three wells, one injector, two observation wells for the CO2 injection. Uh, looking at the porosity distribution and permeability distribution is very heterogeneous uh, and moderately low uh, permeability uh, formation. And there are multiple publications on the CO2 injection test. So first we uh, just replaced CO2 with hydrogen and uh, try to keep everything uh, consistent. And here I'm comparing the CO2 injection versus hydrogen in a map of saturation. Uh, where we have seven injection wells, seven boundary wells to maintain pressure, and injecting for three years at pilot injection rate uh, that was done. So if you compare the saturation of CO2 versus hydrogen, you see that hydrogen has moved up uh, to the top surface much more than CO2, and it also spreads uh, much more uh, than CO2. So definitely is telling you that we need to do some different optimization for hydrogen to be able to store it in smaller confined volume and be able to produce it uh, easier. So then uh, we converted this model to a hydrogen storage using only one injector well that is going to be also used as extraction well. Uh, keeping the boundary wells for pressure maintenance and then allowing for five uh, pump wells uh, for our sensitivity cases. Uh, so then we'd be able to uh, produce some fluids uh, during the uh, project. Uh, the strategy of the injection was to do initial fill up about 12 months of injection and six months of production and then two cycles each three months uh, for um, storing and extracting. And we constrained the hydrogen injection to about 6,000 PSI volume hole pressure and about 25 million standard cubic feet per day of injection. And then we did a lot of sensitivities. I'm just mentioning um, two of them here. One, uh, looking at the perforation for the injection well. So uh, the base case, uh, the wells, they were perforated over the entire thickness, uh, 20 layers. But then we said, how about we just inject and extract from the lower uh, layers from 10 to 20. And then the third case is adding uh, five pump wells uh, with the pressure constraint on those uh, wells. So here I'm comparing the maps of uh, saturation for three different cases. So case uh, 1.1 and 1.2, uh, there are no pump wells, but just injecting at different layers. You really cannot tell much of difference in terms of the saturation distribution, at least uh, close to the uh, cap rock. But then for the case of the pump wells, you see much larger spreading. And uh, actually the results indicated we can produce uh, more uh, when we have the pump wells in operation. So these are the five pump wells, and this is the injection well uh, that uh, contributed uh, quite a bit uh, to the capacity and uh, working uh, volume. So now uh, in terms of the buoyancy of hydrogen and how the uh, perforation of the wells or uh, inclusion of the pump wells will impact it, we compared uh, the top layer, one of the top layers, layer four versus the layer 11 uh, and saturation of the hydrogen uh, for these different cases. And of course, you see for every case, you have more hydrogen uh, moving upward. Uh, so you have the gravity overwrite, especially with such low density of hydrogen and more spreading with the case of uh, pump wells. Uh, and then we looked at the volume 
of uh, how much we can inject and how much we produce in each of these uh, three cases. Uh, and of course, in terms of injection, they're very uh, similar, all three cases, but the production and the extraction of the hydrogen was the highest uh, when we included the pump wells. And of course, uh, with the pump wells, uh, we are also producing some uh, hydrogen in addition to the water and displacing the water with the pump wells helped increasing the hydrogen capacity uh, in the formation. The next case is a, a depleted oil reservoir that was considered for natural uh, gas storage in Colorado. So by the time uh, the company was considering uh, storage of natural gas in the formation, there was very little uh, gas and oil and was mainly water because it was water flooded for many, many years. So we consider that as our second case uh, where the reservoir uh, characteristics is kind of interesting. Uh, it was a sort of a channel sand with the high permeability here, the red is the channel, and the non-channel sand with the lower permeability of uh, 10 uh, millidarcy. The natural gas um, project included nine injection and withdrawal wells, 15 pump wells, and of course we looked at different scenarios of uh, injection and extraction. Uh, one of them was again a longer uh, fill up time, a 12 month injection and six month production, and then doing a three month uh, period, uh, multiple cycles for uh, five years. Uh, there is also an uh, aquifer, so there is additional support uh, for this reservoir and these arrows, they show the connection uh, to the reservoir uh, with the aquifer. So first uh, we compared again natural gas and hydrogen, keeping all the conditions uh, the same as the natural gas. And here I'm showing you the saturation uh, map of natural gas versus hydrogen. Uh, and uh, again, you see that natural gas because of its properties of uh, viscosity and density is more confined. And a lot of it is actually is in the uh, dome of the formation, whereas the hydrogen spreads more along the uh, high permeability uh, channel. And if you look at the uh, volumes that we store, the blue uh, is the natural gas and the orange, uh, the hydrogen for different cycles. Uh, it's uh, interesting to notice that uh, you're going to increase more and more storage in uh, subsequent cycles. Initially it might be low, but then you're going to increase it for both natural gas and hydrogen. But then uh, natural gas uh, has much higher uh, capacity than uh, hydrogen. So uh, when we compare these two cases, we noticed that uh, we cannot inject as uh, the same rate as the natural gas. It was also uh, about 10% less injectivity with hydrogen because we reached the max, uh, maximum uh, uh, pressure uh, very quickly. Uh, and then the working capacity was about 32% less uh, with hydrogen. More saturation of hydrogen came uh, to the surface. So definitely we need to optimize the storage for uh, hydrogen. This is comparing the saturation uh, for natural gas and hydrogen in different layers. Again, you see significant buoyancy, uh, gravity overwrite uh, of uh, both gases to the surface, but to, the, to some extent more in hydrogen. And then you have more spreading of the hydrogen versus uh, natural gas in every uh, cycle that we were looking at. And then uh, we did uh, sensitivity studies looking at the location of the well completions, orientations, uh, how we operate, uh, other sensitivities, looking at the relative permeability, uh, critical gas saturation, temperature, pump wells, and of course you see uh, significant differences in terms of the uh, how much you can inject, how much is recycled, and the working capacity. But based on the sensitivity studies that we, we did, 
relative permeability and addition of the pump wells, they have the highest impact on the efficiency of the storage. I have to skip the Frio, uh, but um, we also looked at this case and we saw uh, again significant differences between hydrogen and CO2. So the ongoing research, uh, we're collaborating with uh, Dr. Payman uh, Mostadimi from University of South Wales in Australia, and he's interested to collaborate with UT Austin uh, to uh, look at you know, poor uh, scale uh, modeling uh, of hydrogen and brine, uh, in addition to conducting relative permeability experiments for uh, hydrogen and water, and hopefully we're going to use his data and try to upscale it to um, field scales. So this is my uh, last slide. Uh, so the takeaway message, uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, you know, hydrogen might actually be uh, contributing the total energy demand uh, about 18%. These are the predictions by 2050. So one of the major challenges for the hydrogen economy is its storage. And for porous media storage, we need a clear understanding of uh, fluid dynamics, containment security, withdrawal rates, and storage capacity. And some of our preliminary simulations and looking at other published results, there are no technical barriers to store hydrogen in depleted oil gas reservoirs or saline aquifers. We have a lot of uh, experience doing it for different gases. Uh, I believe that we need to have a better handle of petrophysical properties, relative perm, capillary pressure, readability for a given storage site. We need to look at the impact of hysteresis because now when you do the cycles of injection and extraction, the direction of saturation changes, so hysteresis may contribute uh, quite a bit and also due to the properties of hydrogen compared to uh, other gases or water, you may have fingering, viscous fingering and gravity uh, fingering that may uh, occur. Uh, geochemistry needs to be looked at. I know Dr. Mohanty uh, is going to uh, start looking at the uh, interactions of hydrogen with some minerals and fluids in situ. There are a lot of discussions on biological uh, impact and especially if we generate uh, H2S, if we have some of the sulfur minerals like pyrite, gypsum and hydride. So that needs to be looked at uh, for a specific site. So um, in summary, analogous to other subsurface projects, we need a multidisciplinary research, uh, including uh, laboratory modeling and field pilot studies. Uh, to understand geology, physics, geochemistry, biochemistry, uh, and uh, hydrogen transport for future uh, safe and efficient uh, storage projects. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for that very nice presentation. We have some questions coming in here. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of related ones about injectivity. I think these would be good for um, Dr. Delshad. So, the first question is about maintaining injectivity in a in a system of finite volume and uh, whether it'd be possible to use brine somehow to improve the hydrogen injectivity. So uh, could you comment on that? Um, I'm not sure if I understand uh, the brine using brine for injectivity. Peter, is that clear to you what that? Uh... Well, maybe it relates to using pump wells, right? And active pressure management, right? So. Well, if it's related to the pump wells, actually we found that very interesting um, uh, observation. During the natural gas, the case I showed you for natural gas uh, storage, they included the pump wells, but the pump wells, they were actually active during the injection of natural gas. What we found out for hydrogen, actually we need to activate the pump wells in order to be able to inject more, store more and produce back more during the withdrawal cycles. 
So that was one of the interesting observation and optimization that we did, that they're very effective in terms of producing a lot of water, uh, leaving space for the hydrogen, and at the same time, you're also going to produce more hydrogen through the pump wells. This next question is also for Dr. Delshad. Um, it's about the, the simulator. Um, I don't know if you, did you guys use a, uh, a commercial simulator for this or your, okay, commercial simulator. I see you nodding. Well, let me yeah, you, make a you, comment yeah. here. Uh, yes. yes, for these cases, because the original models, they were already in CMG. And uh, CMG GEM has all the capabilities we need for hydrogen storage, at least for uh, what we've been looking at. But uh, we do have our own in-house simulators that eventually I think we're going to migrate to those because we want to look at geochemistry and we have the coupling with Freaky for geochemistry. We have the capability of doing the uh, biological reactions with our own in-house codes that you may not find them in the commercial simulators. Uh, potentially fractures, faults, uh, all of those I think we're going to eventually switch to our own in-house simulators. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question. I think this one um, could go to Dr. Eichubel. Um, It's about site selection. So how is site selection different for hydrogen storage compared to carbon dioxide storage? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, um, there's a fundamental difference. Uh, CO2 we want to dispose of for good, and the hydrogen we want to contain um, and maximize the, product, the, the, the production um, um, after injection. So ultimately, they serve different purposes. Um, we need a well-defined um, structure for the hydrogen um, to avoid the dispersion in parts of the reservoir that we cannot retrieve the hydrogen from. Whereas in CO2, I'm not so worried about that part, right? So fundamentally they're different. And um, the other part is that um, the cost, right? So we want to reserve the best, the prime pore space probably for hydrogen storage because it's multiple cycles of injection production. Whereas um, for CO2, it's a one time. So once the reservoir is full, we move on to different reservoir, right? Um, so the idea of stacked reservoirs um, that may sound good in paper in practice, it may not really work that well because the structure may be a different one, but maybe different layers, right? Different stratigraphic horizons being used for this, not necessarily the same location. OK, thank you for that. Uh, this next question, I think we probably have time for one more question. This is for Dr. Delshad, and it's about considering geomechanical effects. How important are they, and are there good simulation tools that are able to address that problem? Yes, I, I think you know uh, now we because of all the unconventional shale and looking at you know hydraulic fractures, natural fractures, and uh, geomechanics. Of course, uh, commercial simulators, in-house uh, simulators, we have that capability, and of course, we're going to look into that as well. All right. Well, it's one o'clock, and. Um, I think that we'll have to stop for now. I'd like to thank everybody for attending and thank you so much to our speakers for a very interesting webinar today. As I said at the beginning, this webinar will be posted to YouTube within a few days and you can check our website or our social media feeds uh, for information on how to access that. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your Friday.